Hey, what's up UCC? My name's Steven, so glad you're joining us today. And um, I got a question for you. Have you ever been completely overwhelmed? Just like in over your head, life feels crazy. Because for me, fall of 2019 was one of the craziest seasons. Like when I asked that question, that is like the time of my life that things just felt wild. My wife and I, we were living in Oak Park and uh, we found out we were pregnant and it was kind of like, okay, you know what? We're gonna move closer to family, closer to home. And so uh, we decided we were gonna sell our house. But we decided we were gonna sell it by owner, which I don't know if you know anything about real estate, but I didn't. And that made that such a chaotic process. It was just like issue after issue after issue. And at the same time, we're working on buying a house back home, also confusing, also complicated. And finally it happened where we, we figured out what we were doing with our old house. We had the new one lined up and it was time to move. And so with my wife being eight months pregnant, we loaded everything we had up and we moved to Macomb. And on the, it was kind of like a two day move, right? So day one, day two, just because apparently we accumulated so much stuff. But on the first day of the move, we got the truck unloaded. And I remember just feeling terrible. I was running a high fever. I couldn't eat anything. And I just laid on the couch that we had in the middle of this house of boxes and was like, I have to do another day. So after day two of moving, the sickness got worse and worse to the point where I had two weeks after moving into this new place where I was completely out. I was on the couch, I couldn't eat, I was feverish, it was terrible. My eight month pregnant wife is setting the house up trying to get ready for our son coming and it was just chaos. Then December hits, our son was due at the end of the month, we went in for a checkup and found out that little man was breached. He was trying to come into the world butt first and uh, Alyssa had really had her eyes set on a, on a natural birth and so we decided to try this procedure called aversion, which I had never heard of before. But what that means is we went to a hospital and paid some medical prof professionals. One of them, literally the phrase was, do you want the butt or the head. And one of them pushed my son's head, one of them pushed on his butt and tried to flip him manually in my wife's womb. And it was barbaric and it was painful. And unfortunately, after like all this time and pain, it was unsuccessful. And we had to schedule the C-section. And again, it just felt like thing after thing after thing. So we scheduled the C-section for two days after Christmas, which sounds crazy, right? Well, we have Christmas, the next day we go in to kind of get some of the pre-op stuff done. They look at my wife's vitals, they look at her, Alyssa's vitals and say, you know what, we see some symptoms of preeclampsia, baby needs to come today. And so all of a sudden we're across the street, we're in the hospital, our daughter's with us. It was this huge whirlwind of finding somebody to come get her. It's in the aftermath of the holiday, so it's all just like kind of confusing. And I can just remember after all this craziness, the houses, the moving, the sickness, the pregnancy, the flipping, I remember sitting in that hospital room with my wife, with our newborn son, and just thinking, I can't wait to get home and have some kind of just normal and calm. And then, I don't know if you remember early 2020, but then that happened. And it just, again, it just was like over and over and over, and we were just so overwhelmed. And I got to imagine, if you're watching this right now, you can remember, you can think of a time in your life where you would say, yes, like, I've been there, I've been overwhelmed, right? Like, we all have. And there's different things that get us there. Sometimes it's our decisions, right? Like we make poor choices that put us there. I chose to sell my house by owner. That was a decision. I, we decided to move when my wife was that pregnant. That was a decision, right? And it kind of added to the overwhelmingness. But then at the same time, our circumstances, the things outside of our control, so often those are the things that make us end up in that season of being overwhelmed, right? Whether it's you, you lose your job or the inflation going on around us, right? Like that causes some things when all of a sudden money feels tight because the situation's outside of our control. Um, it might be that you have a dream for your family that just gets shattered. All of a sudden your family's future looks different. Or maybe it's the loss of a loved one, a, a family member or a mentor that you lose. And that, that can be a difficult thing where life feels overwhelming or it could be a turn in your own health situation, right? But at the end of the day, all of these things, our choices, our circumstances, whatever it might be, they can kind of feel like they pile up to this place where we would just say, man, I am feeling overwhelmed. And what I want to do is I kind of want to walk through what we do in this season. What can we do? And a lot of what we're going to talk about today is from uh, inspired by this book. It's called, If You Want to Walk on Water, You've Got to Get Out of the Boat. It's by this guy, John Ortberg, a uh, great resource. But but what we're going to do for the kind of the remainder of our time together is we're going to talk about this idea of being overwhelmed with a little bit of a metaphor. So you might not see it at first, but just humor me, go with me for a second. Because what I believe, what I believe is that being overwhelmed is a lot like being in a cave. 
right? And like I said, that might not sound obvious to you at first, but over and over again, what we see in scripture is people in times of being overwhelmed where they run to a cave. And I think it's a really suiting uh, metaphor. It's a good image for this feeling of being overwhelmed. Because I'm not talking like, wow, what a big, beautiful cave. But think about like being in a dark cave where things feel tight, where you can't quite see the way ahead, where your footing feels uneven, where you're not sure how long you're going to be in there till you find the way out, right? Like that idea, that imagery, that is what I'm talking about when I say that being overwhelmed is a lot like being over in a cave. And I don't know if you can remember the last time you've been overwhelmed, but I bet some of those images, some of those d- descriptions might line up with that. And to make matters more complicated, what seems to happen is that in these seasons of life where we're in the cave, it seems to me that in these seasons is when God can be quiet. Like frustratingly and sometimes almost pitifully silent. That it's in these moments where life feels like it's crushing down, that we feel like we're trying to call it to God and they can just feel like nothing's there. And we can find ourselves kind of spiraling to a point where we really are having a hard time envisioning a way out or a future. And and into that, I kind of want to just acknowledge something. There's kind of like some some bad news we kind of have to face. And, And this is that like, even if you're not right now, if you feel like life's good right now, that's great. But the reality is all of us will find ourselves in a moment where we're in the cave. Like every single one of us, like it is kind of a a given of life that we will have a moment where things are overwhelming, where we're back in that cave, right? And and at the same time, you might be on the way out of one right now. You might be like, no, Stephen, like it's been a rough couple years, but things are looking up. Like my business is looking better, my finances, my marriage, whatever it is. It's kind of, I feel like I'm coming out of something and that's great. Like celebrate that. But the reality is the chances are really good. You will find yourself back in the cave at some point. It's kind of just a reality of our life that we will find ourselves in seasons where we're in the cave. And so it's important for us to acknowledge that it is a given that we will be in that cave. But what we do with our time in that cave is so important because it'll determine who we are and where we go when we come out of the cave. And so we don't want to be neglectful of it. We need to recognize we will be in that cave, but what we do there is important. And that's kind of the bad news, right? It's going to happen, but there's some good news, right? There's good news we can cling to, and that is that I believe God does some of his very best work in caves. I believe we see example after example in scripture of God showing up to people who are in seasons or they're in a cave. Listen, literally in caves. In um, 1 Kings 19, just to give you some examples, there's the story of this guy, Elijah. He's a prophet of God who uh, is just worn down, beaten up, thinks he's just ready to throw in the towel. And we see him in a cave where God calls him out and appears to him as a tiny whisper and restores Elijah. It's an amazing story. Um, In Daniel 6, we see the story of of Daniel uh, being faithful to God. And as a consequence, he's thrown into a cave, a lion's den. And he's shut in there with the intention of these lions eating him. But God shuts the lion's mouth and saves Daniel. And then out of that story, Daniel is raised up out of this cave and restored and actually brought to a place of prominence. It's an amazing story of God's faithfulness. Um, in 1 Kings 18, the prophet Obadiah, he, uh, he hides the Lord's prophets from the king Jezebel who's coming to kill them. Right? He's able to hide over a hundred prophets in caves from this, from this queen so that they're able to continue doing the work of God. He hides them in caves. Um, in Luke 2, we hear the story of our Savior being born. And I don't know like, what your picture of the Christmas story is. Oftentimes we picture like a stable, kind of like we'd go to the farm and see. But the reality is that the stable Jesus was born and the place Jesus was born was very likely much more like a cave-like structure, a carved out stone structure where the animals were kept. And that's where our Savior was born. And in his time on earth, in, uh, in John 11, we see an amazing miracle where his uh, friend Lazarus had died and been placed in a cave his body, and Jesus rose him from the grave and brought him back and called him out of that cave. Not to mention the fact that our faith, our Savior, after he died on the cross, was put in a tomb, would have been carved out of rock. He's put in this cave, and in that cave, in that cave, we know that he conquered death, that he redeemed our sins. This amazing thing happens, and three days later, he walks out alive with our hope. Right? That happened in a cave. So I'll say it again. God does some of his best work in caves over and over and over again in the Bible. We see that. And what I want to do today is dive into a specific story that much like these stories starts with with despair and what feels like hopelessness. 
what feels like uncertainty. And on the other side, we see the power of God in it. And the story I want to dive into today is a story of this guy named David. He ended up being a great uh, king of Israel, but we're going to actually jump before that when we jump in on this story. And what happened at this point in David's life is he's really, things are looking good for him, right? He had been uh, a shepherd out in the fields watching sheep, but he had been kind of brought into the king's quarters, into the king's chambers, and he was... um, uh, he was like a musician for the king, which was a great spot for him, a real upgrade from sitting out in the field with the sheep. But not only that, he also became a great warrior for the king. And, and he was so successful. He had success after success after success that people were praising him like he was the man. He walked through the streets and people were literally, literally singing songs praising the, the things he had done out on the battlefield, what he had led God's people to in battle. And man, he was beloved, which was great. Until the king at that time, Saul, became jealous and decided that David was a threat to him and he must kill him. And that's exactly why I will always make sure I never preach as good of a sermon as Chris. I always got to shoot below him just for, you know, personal safety reasons, right? Don't want to upset your boss. But right, but David's in this position where things look great and all of a sudden his boss says, nope, that's enough. And he decides he's going to have him killed. So in that moment, David goes from this place of being on the rise of having just like financial things, like everything's lining up and all of a sudden his job's gone. His financial security is gone. His literal life security is gone. And he has to run. And in that process, um, his wife uh, helps him. She essentially will cover for him so he can get away. But in the process, as David runs, his wife stays behind to cover for him and she ends up being married off to somebody else. So David loses loses his wife. And from there, he flees to this place called Rana, where he visits his mentor, Samuel. And uh, he, he stays with him for a little while until King Saul hears he's there and sends soldiers after him. And so David, again, has to run from, uh, from Saul, has to leave his mentor. He runs and unfortunately will never get to see Samuel again before he dies. He, he loses that connection. He has to run from his mentor We'll never see him again. So he loses his wife. He loses his income, his stability, his mentor. He runs to his best friend, Jonathan. And he says, Jonathan, you got to help me. Like he, the king's after me. And unfortunately, uh, the king is Jonathan's dad. And he says, I can't turn on him. I, I, I can't turn on my dad. I can't betray him. You have to run. So he also loses his best friend and he runs. And he runs to the only place he can think of, which is Philistine territory. And the Philistines were the enemies of the Israelites, the people that David was going off and having wars and having conquest over. He had to run to their territory. And he said, man, if they recognize me, if they know who I am, I'm done. So he decides to act insane. He acts literally crazy. And um, the Philistines uh, see this crazy guy coming and they chase him off. But they say, no, we don't want him around here. Get him, get him away. Get him away. And so David runs again. He's running and he's running and he's running literally for his life. And he finally runs to this place called the Cave of Adullam. And it's just such a a fitting metaphor. Come back to this metaphor of being overwhelmed. Like David's overwhelmed. David's running for his life. And where does he run? To a cave. This cave where there's this this great mountain of weight pressing down on him. Where he he is hemmed in. Where he is running out of options. He's literally gone everywhere. He couldn't even live as a, as a madman in enemy territory. He is out of options and he goes to this cave. And what's really interesting is that um, in this cave, we get a really interesting snapshot. So David wrote many psalms. In our Bible, there's a book called Psalms. They're songs to the Lord. And David wrote many, many of these. Um, and we believe, and by we, I mean experts believe that Psalm 142 was actually written while David was in this cave, while David was in this season. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to kind of walk through that psalm. And what we'll see is that what David wrote um, during this time where he's in the cave, right? And what, more so what David did in this time in the cave, and which we see because of what he wrote from the cave, it kind of gives us like a, a template, a blueprint, something to look at. What do I do with my own time in that? And we get a snapshot into that from Psalm 142. And we're going to see several things that David did with that time in the cave that we can learn from and we can apply in our own lives. And so the first thing we see as we're going to read through the psalm is that in that time in the cave, David was honest with God. Right? David was honest with God. In Psalm 142, it opens up in uh, verse 1. It says, I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out before him my complaint. Before him I tell my trouble. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who watch over my way. In the path where I walk, people have hidden a snare for me. 
Look and see, there is no one at my right hand. No one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. Do you hear this honesty? He says, man, God, like, here's my complaint. Things are bad. Nobody has my back. I'm alone. Right? He goes to God and just is like, this is a bad situation. Like, this is not good. And I love that he just approaches God with honesty. Because for a lot of us, we have a hard time being honest when things aren't looking that good. Right? Think about when it comes to your boss or something at work. Like nobody wants to be the one to go give the boss the bad news. Right? The deadline's not going to happen. We're not meeting where, what we thought we would. Right? Uh, this team's not operating the th- way we thought it would. All those moments, so often we want to try to cover up the things that are bad. We want to kind of present an image of like, things are okay. Yeah, it might be a little rocky, but we got it under control. And I love that David is just honest. He's like, nope, things are not okay. Things are not good. Right? But again, think how often we try to cover up when things aren't okay. We do that with people in our lives, but we also do that with our relationship with God. We try to cover up the reality sometimes of what's going on. We try to have these like prayers where even though the world feels like it's falling down around us, we're like, hey God, like it's me. We come so like meekly before him, but can I point something out? Like it is, it's pointless to try to cover up the reality from God. Like this is the God who sees it. And yet sometimes we're too timid, we're too afraid to really come to him with honesty. And I want to encourage you, if you're, in the, if you're in the cave, just like David, we see that like God is not afraid of your honesty. So when you're in that moment, when you're in that cave, be honest with God. Don't try to sugarcoat your prayers. Don't try to give God some polished version of what's going on. Because number one, like you're not tricking him, he knows. But more importantly, like God can handle it. God can handle all of your doubts, your insecurities, your fears, your questions, your anger even. Really, you can go to him with what is true and real because he knows anyways and he can take it. And in fact, I think what we see from David is that it's it's an incredibly healthy thing for us that in these moments of being in the cave that we can go and be honest with God. And so again, we see that David's honest with God and and as we move on, we're going to see that David was also, he was also very aware that he was dependent on God. That David was dependent on God. In Psalm 142, 5 to 7, he says, I cry to you, Lord. I say, You are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. Set me free from my prison, that I may praise your name. Then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. You hear the dependence he lays out in there? He says, Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. He's like, I have tried and tried and tried. And you know what I figured out? I can't do it. God, I need you. They are too strong for me, but they're not too strong for you. God, I need you. You are my refuge. Do you see how he's, he's aligning himself? He's saying, God, you are the one that I'm turning to. You are the one that I need to step in here. And again, there's something important about this idea of being dependent on God. Right? And recognizing that. Recently, I got to go golfing uh, with a group. We had a group that went out on a golf outing. And um, I'm a bad golfer. Let's just say, let's just put that straight. I golf once every couple of years. Um, it's generally pretty rough. Uh, lots of in the woods, in the water, searching for it, you know, mulligans, all that fun stuff. But we got to do this thing. It was a scramble where we were playing best ball. So out of our little group of four, we'd all tee off. We'd all, you know, do a drive or whatever. And whoever had the best shot, you'd go play from there. Which meant that I could walk up. I could swing at that ball, and whether it went in the woods, went in the water, went five feet, it didn't matter because somebody else was going to walk up. We had a guy on our team who was a good golfer, and he'd hit the shot, and his would be straight and playable and not lost in the woods, and we'd drive in our golf carts to there, and we'd all play from there. And it was so great because instead of being so concerned about what I could do and, and how bad my shot was, well, no, I didn't have to worry about that. I just got to play. I just got to go along because there was somebody else. There's somebody else who was taking care of it, right? There was somebody else who was going to have the good drive. And guess what? We even used a couple of mine because when the pressure was off, when I wasn't trying to carry the burden of like, oh my gosh, I got to stay straight. I got to stay on the green. Every once in a while with that pressure off, I was actually able to perform and do something. I was like, whoa, look at me go. Look out, Tiger Woods. I think I know like one other golfer. So sorry if that's the wrong reference. Mickelson is one, but stay with me here. The point being that like when the pressure was off my shoulders, I could just be there. I could just have fun. And sure, I wanted to shoot better. And sure, I wanted to perform. But it wasn't up to me. Nobody was expecting me to be the one to carry the team. Because we know who did have the control over their shot. We knew who did know how to golf. And he was kind of carrying the team, right? And it just freed everybody else up. And it's the same way with our faith. It's the same way. We're in this season in the cave. Sometimes we want to try to hold on to control. 
But we look at David and he just recognizes like, man, I don't, I don't have the control. But there's a freedom. There's a freedom that comes from giving up trying to hold on to control of something that we can't control anyways. There's a freedom that comes from that. But what's even more amazing is that as much as there's freedom when we give up that control, there's security and peace when we know who is in control. And so we see David and he is honest with God and he is aware and honest about his dependence on God. David is radically dependent on God. God, you alone are who I need. You are my refuge. Right? When you're in the cave, look to him because he is the one who is in control. And that's where we're going to find freedom. That's where we're going to find peace. That's where we're going to find security. So David's honest. David's dependent. And finally, what we see is that David was strengthened by God. David was strengthened by God. So what happens in this cave of Adullam is that all of a sudden there's all these other refugees, all these other outcasts, people who are on the run that flock to David. And he's kind of like the outcast leader at this camp at Ziklag, it's called. And literally all these people are kind of coming around David. And he has this little ragtag group of just kind of down on their luck people that are looking to him. And what happens is uh, these people come through, these enemies come through, raid their camp, and, and run off with their, their women and their children and their stuff. And it is, it's brutal. These people who are already down on their luck, all of a sudden things are like worse. And the Bible says, it, it's super dramatic, it says that they wept until there were no more tears. Like these people were devastated, they were heartbroken. And they had all this grief, and that grief turned towards, to anger towards David. And they decide, you know what? That's it. We're going to take David's life for this. We're going to blame him. And he's going to pay for what happened to our wives. Imagine David in this moment. It's like running for your life, running for your life, running for your life, running for your life. You're in the cave. There's nowhere else to go. You have this little community. And oh, guess what? Now somebody else wants your life again. Like, can you imagine the exhaustion? Can you imagine like the will this ever end? Can you just feel that cave crushing in? But listen what happens. We see the story in 1 Samuel 36. It says, David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. It's a fair reason to be distressed. Can we agree? It says, each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But listen to this. It says, but David found strength in the Lord his God. You catch that change? He's, He's running and he's running and he's running. But in this cave, in this moment... He's distressed. He's worried. Yeah, things still don't look so great. But David found strength in the Lord his God. He was honest with God. He was dependent on God. And ultimately, he finds this strength from God. And there's a lesson we can pull out of this. And and here's what I need you to hear. If you're in that cave, if you're in that cave, here's what you need to know. If you can't get out of it, get into it. I know that sounds a little bit weird. If you can't get out of it, get into it. And here's, here's what I mean by that. Oftentimes, the cave is not something that we can simply navigate our way out of. It's not like, oh man, things are crushing down. I need to make this decision and this decision and then things will be better. I just need to move this thing here and then things are better. No, oftentimes when we're in the cave, it's a matter of patience. It's a matter of time, right? It's things that we cannot directly influence ourselves. There are things that we have to wait for. Remember, David's dependent on God. And so in that time, we can try to be escapist and just like wish things were gone or we can lean into what God is doing in that moment what God is looking to do in this time. And I want to share with you, if you're in the cave, if you're in that moment, I have a psalm I want to share with you that I think this is one for you to kind of hang on to. This is one for you to write down, for you to read daily. Because I think it is an amazing example of the principles we've talked about today. And this is Psalm 77. And and, and here's what David says here. Psalm 77, he says, I cry out to God, yes, I shout. Oh, that God would listen to me. When I was in deep trouble, I searched for the Lord. All night long, I prayed with hands lifted towards heaven but my soul was not comforted. I love this. Have you ever like, been in a situation where you're super distressed and you pray and you're like, nothing feels better? And you almost feel guilty about that because you're like, oh, give it to God in prayer, give it to God in prayer. And you're like, I am, it still feels bad. And you almost feel like weird admitting that. Guess what? It's in your Bible. David says, I prayed and I didn't feel better. That's there. So don't feel like you're crazy for that. Like this is written down. I, my soul was not comforted. He says, I think of God and I moan, overwhelmed with longing for his help. He's like, God, where are you? You don't let me sleep. I am too distressed even to pray. 
I think of the good old days long since ended when my nights were filled with joyful songs. I search my soul and ponder the difference now. Has the Lord rejected me forever? Will he never again be kind to me? Is his unfailing love gone forever? Have his promises permanently failed? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he slammed the door on his compassion? And I said, this is my fate. The Most High has turned his hand against me. Do you hear David? He's in this place where he is just like, God, where are you? God, when is this going to get better? Will this never, have you forgotten me? Are you gone? Do you hear the honesty in this? Do you see it just like the God, like, I need you. Where are you? There's like a desperation in this psalm. But listen where he goes. He says, but then I recall all you've done, O Lord. I remember your wonderful deeds of long ago. They are constantly in my thoughts. I cannot stop thinking about your mighty works. Oh God, your ways are holy. Is there any God as mighty as you? You are the God of great wonders. You demonstrate your awesome power among the nations. I love this. There's this moment where it's like all of these things piling up, all of these things wrong. But God, I remember who you are. But God, I'm going to cling to that. God, I'm going to remember what you did and that's going to help me trust you in my present and my future. Right? I know you've moved in my past. I know you're with me now. I know you're moving in my future even when I don't feel it. And reading this psalm, I, I love how human it is. Because on the one hand, he's like, God, where are you? And he's like, God, I trust you. And you're like, wait, how is it both at once? But think about our own nature. Aren't, aren't we both at once? Or have you ever been in that moment where you're like, God, I want to trust you. God, what the heck is going on? And those things are coexisting. Like, that is real. That is honest. Remember, we can be real with God. But what we see in this is that what David does is he looks to God and he says, look it. I don't know what's going on. I'm exhausted. I'm overwhelmed. But God, I'm going to cling to you. Because again, here's, here's what you need to catch. When you're in the cave, the point isn't getting out of the cave. We feel like in these seasons, the point is to get through them and out of them, but it's not. It's that when we're in these moments where it feels like nothing good can come of it, where nothing good will ever happen, that we have a God who is working. Even we don't, we don't sense it, even we don't notice it, we have a God who is working, that we experience God working in that cave. And what's going to happen is we're going to be able to look back on these times in our life where God felt absent and silent. We're going to see that they were seasons where he did something we never could have comprehended, right? It's in these seasons of being overwhelmed. It's in those seasons where we just want to get out that God is doing great things. That God is moving in ways we never would have seen coming. Right? And again, it's in those moments where we say, I just want to be through this. I just want to be on the other side of it. God, when is this going to be over? I just want some peace. I just want some calm. I just want some stability. God, when will this be done? It's in those moments, it's in that cave that I believe you will look back and see God was working in ways that you never expected. Working in ways that are bigger than you ever saw coming, right? So again, remember, it's, it's how we handle our time in that cave that will determine who we are and where we go when we come out of it. So rather than despising it, let's, let's get into it. Let's, let's embrace this time as much as we can, as much as it's painful, as much as it's hard. When we're in that cave, let's lean in. Let's use this opportunity to be honest with God, to be real, to be raw, to use this as a time to have intense vulnerability with God, to, to have dependence on Him, scary dependence. I don't know if this is going to work out dependence on God because ultimately I believe that's what's going to lead us to being strengthened by Him where we're going to look back and see that He did something we never could have imagined in that season in the cave. And as we're going through that, the thing that we can cling to, the truth that I believe and that I want you to walk out of here is with this, is that God does some of his very best work in caves. I pray for you. So God, uh, I just thank you so much for just uh, the example we see in the life of David here, God, where he's just, he's in over his head, God, he's overwhelmed, but that he turns to you, God, that he's honest that he's aware of his dependence and his need for you, Lord, and that in that is where he finds his strength. God, would you make that true of us? God, for those of us that are watching that are just in the middle of that cave right now, God, whether it's financially or, or medically or relationally, God, whatever, whatever's going on, even whatever combination of these things that feels like they're crushing on us, God, would you, help, would you help us to turn to you? Would you help us to just give it to you, God, that we would find peace in a season that doesn't feel very peaceful, Lord? Just a supernatural peace that only comes from you. And God, for, the, for those of us that aren't in the cave, that have the, the privilege of being just uh, feeling like we're on solid ground late right now, Lord, would you allow us to keep our eyes focused on you so that when they do come, God, whether it's by our choice or by our circumstance, God, would you help us to keep our eyes fixed on you? Would you help us to have our hope anchored in you, Lord? Because we know that even in the moments where that feel the most hopeless, that feel the most helpless, 
God, that in those moments that you are at work, God, that you are never absent, even if we feel like you can't hear you, God, and that you are doing good work in those seasons. Would you give us that hope, that faith, God, the strength that only comes from you. Lord, we ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen.